All right, welcome back. We are here for another episode of The Unplanned Show. My guest today, Matt Leinbarger. Am I saying your name correctly, Matt? You Uh, are saying my name correctly, yes. Leinbarger, just like it's spelled. Wonderful. Um, uh, So excited to have Matt on. We got to meet actually in person a few weeks ago uh, when we were both at the Dreamforce event. Um, and, but we've uh, kind of uh, exchanged notes and whatnot online and, uh, uh, over Slack and whatnot. So excited to get to Matt, meet Matt in person. And we get to talking about how I suspected he had a list in his mind of the things that every pager duty user should probably know. Matt leads the customer success engineering group here at pager duty. Uh, which means I imagine he sees time and again with trying to make customers successful, some of the things that they should be doing and uh, those patterns. So who doesn't love a good list? I don't know what the number is. I think Matt might know what the number is and he will tell us. I know what it is right now. I don't know what it might be end up being, but. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'll get, we'll get the, uh, the sticky notes ready and see what we can come up with. Um, Let's see. Oh, and I forgot to set this up. But um, before we get going, I always like to share a few um, notes about upcoming episodes that we have. Uh, Up next, we will have Nicole Bagat talking about PagerDuty's APIs. So this should be a fun one. Um, uh, I've I've worked with Nicole on API scopes uh, that have been added, uh, but there's a number of different things, different APIs. Uh, So again, some sort of um, mysteries hiding in plain sight that I think will be interesting. And then super excited on uh, October 9th, I'll have, um, next up we'll have, uh, after Nicole, we'll have Sam Newman, author of Building Microservices. If you're familiar with that O'Reilly book, I believe it's in its second edition. Uh, And he was, uh, I noticed he tweeted the other week. He's like, I've got some thoughts on resiliency, but curious what other people are thinking. And I was like, hey, Sam, how about we hear those thoughts of yours? Uh, so he has agreed to, to come on to the show. Um, October 16th, I will be at the Gartner Symposium IT Expo uh, down in Orlando. So still working through if we're going to broadcast live or take a week off. But regardless, we will be back October 23rd. We will have Meg Watson of Spotify and our own Tiago Barbosa talking about the PagerDuty plugin for Backstage, uh, which should be an exciting topic, uh, one that I've been kind of poking around the edges for a little while. So glad to have the experts on. Um, And uh, this episode, this is our first time we're actually live streaming to YouTube as well. If you go to PagerDuty's YouTube uh, page, I don't know if it's a page, a site, whatever you call it. Um, You'll find now there are tabs for both live where you can see the upcoming episodes um, like this one today, as well as we've got the the one for Nicole next week already lined up um, and there's buttons there. Um, There's also, you'll see a tab for podcasts, which is essentially the playlist of all of the unplanned show episodes. I don't really know exactly why it becomes a podcast and not just a playlist that's beyond my expertise, but feel free to check it out. And um, you can use that to catch up on past episodes if you like. All right. With that, let's come back to the business at hand. Um, Matt, you've, you've kind of got a list in your head Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I don't know if there's a way that you've already thought about kind of grouping these things in terms of, hey, what's the things that, you know, anybody coming into PagerDuty from, from the get-go, early days versus like, hey, you're, you know, what's the sort of deeper expert level? I'm sure there's things across the spectrum for, for the novices and uh, the folks who've already, you know, beaten a few big bosses. Right. Um, wh- where do you want to start? Well, um, yeah, so I, I was kind of, I was trying to think through that and I was trying to, you know, order things in my head and, and I was like, these aren't necessarily priorities, but um, because I think, you know, different customers deal with different things. Uh, there are, there are some that are just getting started. There are some that have maybe got started like a decade ago and then are just now talking to us again about what's new. And there's a lot new in the last 10 years. 
Um, you know, so so it really just just depends on where a customer is at. Um, but I but I tried to tried to poke through and uh, really think think about you know what are the what are the biggest questions that a lot of people ask or, um, or and I even reached out to my team to ask them you know so I don't want to take all the credit here for these ideas because a lot of this is coming from from them and some of the things that they've they've seen recently too. But um, in typical uh, late night fashion, I do actually have my list here. So <laughs> here's my first one. And it's don't let the name fool you. We're not just a paging company. We're not even actually a paging company. You know, and funny story is I actually, uh, when I got hired at PagerDuty, I thought I should have a pager. You know, I, I work at PagerDuty. So I actually went on eBay and bought a pager. Oh, it doesn't work. It turns on, but it doesn't do anything because the to activate a pager is ridiculously expensive right now, which makes sense. But anyway, we're not a paging company, even though our name is PagerDuty, right? You know, initially we we started off, that was our kind of our bread and butter, right? We wanted to make sure we were contacting the right people, not waking up people in the middle of the night that didn't need to be wake, waking up and, you know, saving organizations money by not getting 20 people on a call that didn't need to be on a call. Uh, but we have expanded way beyond that now, um, you know, especially in the last couple of years when we think through all the different areas of automation that we get involved with now. Uh, so if, if, you know, customers haven't been around uh, or have, have been around for the last couple of years, they've been hearing that a lot. But if they've, uh, you know, if they've been paid your duty customers for a long time, they might not realize, you know, all that we do now in terms of uh, with, uh, you know, between incident workflows and process automation, and event orchestration and and all the different different aspects that uh, make PagerDuty the platform that it is today. So don't let the name fool you. We are, we're more than just paging people. So that's I that's think, my number one. Yeah, I think that's like that's a that's a common scenario, right, that you see in a lot of uh not even just tech companies, but even like open source projects, right? Like something starts to sort of solve one discrete thing, but they evolve and they expand. And and sometimes that even, I remember working with the RabbitMQ community, right? That had a very mm -hmm. sort of discrete purpose. And over time they added ways to get redundancy and um, you know, confirmations. And, and then that what they found was like, people would turn on all the features and they didn't need all the features. And that, that became, you know, in that case, it was like, uh, just people not really understanding like what had happened to this project right. over time and why had additional capabilities been added, but, but now how to properly use them. Um, we kind of, I, I had a joke of like, okay, let's stop the rabbit abuse, right? Like it's um, it's a really common phenomenon, right? Yep. That, that you see across a lot of technologies and, and platforms. So um, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, what are some of the things that are kind of the, the low hanging fruit uh, for, for users of like, oh, you should immediately be going and looking at these settings or, um, you know, something over here that's going to be like immediately unlock some additional yep. value for you. Yeah, no, I think that's great. You know what? You're, you're now you're going to make me go out of order. Because, <laughs> uh, I had an order, but you're, you're leading me into other areas. So that was actually one of my next one was, it was actually my last one. Oh, which is don't okay. ignore the, the small features, you know, or the features that seem small because they're really not small. We see that a lot too with, uh, I think of things like, you know, incident out outliers, um, you know, related incidents, uh, change events is the, is the biggest one that always comes to my mind of how many people aren't taking advantage of it, but how big of an impact it makes, right? Because, you know, we're, we're kind of at the heart of incident management, but, you know, we all know that the one thing that causes incidents is change. So, you know, being able to, to correlate that change data with your incidents that are happening is extremely powerful and i think a lot of people don't realize that that they're able to do that and that we can pretty much integrate with any type of change environment that you have whether it's a ci cd pipeline or you know uh, you know changes in service now or w whatever your your method of change is you know we can ingest that and build that context into your incident management um platform so i think that those those little things are huge um that often get overlooked 
you know, and it's easy when you go to a page and you're like, oh, I've never seen that before. I don't know what it does, but and you kind of gloss over it, but it's worth, worth taking a look sometimes. Yeah. Cause that'll be the thing when you come back and now you're in the midst of an incident and having, these are the related incidents. These were the recent changes on this service. Right. Having those at your fingertips is just indispensable, but it does mean like, you know, you talked about, you've got to have that integration set up with, you know, whatever it is, it's um, that point of reference for changes, whether it's a CICD pipeline or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a, like a CMDB, you know, like what you would use with ServiceNow or something. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a small step, but one that will pay huge dividends. Right. Okay. And I think a lot of times too, you know, customers don't necessarily know, you know, we're a, we're a tech company, we're releasing things all the time. Um, it's not like we have one giant release and here's all this new stuff. Um, you know, we, we introduce new things all the time. And I think another thing that people don't realize too, here's my next one is, uh, you know, new features are a gift. And I, I put this icon here, especially because you'll see if you are a PagerDuty customer, you're going to see that little gift icon at the top right hand of your screen. And you should click it every now and then, especially if it has a little red dot, because it means something's new. And you can go and you can read about whatever it is that we've recently uh, released. And it's a great way to, to stay up to date uh, on, on those things. Uh, so I think if you go there now, you're going to see things about our new Teams workflow action, um, API survey. So it's not just new features either. It's also just kind of what's, what you need to be aware of in the, in the PagerDuty world. Yeah. And that's an interesting point because it involves going to that, console, right? I mean, you know, you've got to you log into the web interface for PagerDuty. And one of the great things uh, about PagerDuty is that it's really expanded the number of surface areas where you could be interfacing over Slack, over Teams, over, um, you know, the mobile app. Um, and there's, so there's all these ways that people can be using PagerDuty day in and day out. And actually, they're never going to log in to the web version. And that's right. where that gift box is. So it's a great call out because, you know, to the, and if the only time you're going there is in, in the middle of an incident when you're not particularly wanting to look at, you know, the little red dot on the gift box, right. find some time to go check it out when, when things are calm. Um, right. So that's a great point. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to like mess up your order too much. Oh, that's fine. I'm, I'm flexible. <laughs> um, all right. So I think what, that was number three. That was number three. Yeah. That was number three. Yes. Three. Yep. Okay. So checking the gift box. Yeah. What's, what's number four. This is cleanup, right? If we're going, if we're talking baseball. Yep. You no. Know, who's going to be batting cleanup with, uh, yep. with things to know. If I if I had so this this next one I, I had as my original number two after that you know we're not just a paging company if I if I could tell everybody one thing about PagerDuty or one piece of advice this is what I would tell them and it's services do not equal teams okay right so it's very easy for a lot of organizations especially when you're first getting started with PagerDuty to want to set up your PagerDuty services to map to your teams directly. And it's really hard to fight that urge. I get it. I've been there. I was a PagerDuty customer and I was like, that's how we should do it. And I was directed, no, don't do that. And I'm very glad that we didn't do that. Um, makes it a whole lot harder to scale. Um, we really, we really want to go all in with that uh, service oriented architecture both internally at PagerDuty, but also for our customers, because we we're, we're, we believe in it so much that we know that it's going to be beneficial to them to build things out in that way. So tell me a little bit more about like, what should people be mapping those services to? Because the other thing I've heard is, you know, someone's like, oh, we have our service just set up as, you know, Datadog. And right. it's just, the service is the source of the alerts. And it that also seemed wonky. And yep. I'm like, sure, you can do that, but I'm not sure that you want to. Right, um, right. So what's your recommendation? Like, how should people... Yeah. It is very flexible, but sometimes that, to your point, like, you're not going to get 
the full benefit of certain features and it may be harder to scale? Like what's the way people should be thinking about how those services map? Yeah, typically when we talk with somebody and walk them through surface architecture, right? It's wanting to be wanting to be as granular as you can be without going crazy is basically what I say, right? So so your data dog, data dog example is a good one, right? Because it might make sense at first, right? We've got this one team, they're, they're handling everything that comes through data dog. So we set it up like that, but then all of a sudden we want to split it in two and domain gets these alerts, Matt gets these alerts, but it's all one service now. Now we're going to have to somehow break this apart and kind of reverse engineer and it just gets messy. Um, but you can go too far granularly too, right? We don't want people going out and naming, you know, the, all of their host names as services because mm-hmm. that would be crazy and um, overcomplicated. Um, so what, what we tend to do is really just think of it as, you know, if you've got, and, and I think most organizations have this somewhere. Sometimes it's written down. Sometimes it's in just in somebody's head. But they usually have those building blocks of whatever their their app stack is or whatever, you know, whatever it is that they're, they care about, you know, so it might be if it's just like a simple, like web app, you might have a a web server service, you might have a database service, or maybe you've got, you want to break that database service into I've got a MySQL service, I've got a, you know, Postgres service. Uh, So so think about it that way. Um, Because the other thing to remember is, and I tell people this one that when we struggle with the teams and services that it's not a it's not a one-to-one relationship. You know, I can, I can be on the database team and I support, you know, 20 different services uh, that are, that are on there. And it's just going to make it go a lot easier, especially if, you know, there's org changes and things like that. So granular, but not too granular. That's, that's the line I give. Okay. Um, That's helpful because that's, that's one that, you know, since kind of running into some of those scenarios, it's, it's hit my radar that I was like, wow, this seems really important, but I don't, I don't know if I could articulate like what is really the best practice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're a little deeper in the lineup here, Matt. Yep. All okay. right. You ready for the next one? I'm ready. Okay. Don't boil the ocean. Mm-hmm. So this is one that I think is really important because if you could, if you look at pager duty and you're, especially if you're just getting started, um, it can be overwhelming try to think, oh, that's, we have a lot of integrations. We've got a lot of teams. We have a lot of services, um, you know, and when, when people are getting started, it's, it sounds like, oh, I've got to, I've got to like do this old school. I've got to put together a project team. I've got to do all this. And I try to tell people, you don't have to do that. You know, pick a team, pick a service, pick an app, just, just start there. Um, we see this a lot too, back to like the services versus teams where, you know, we see companies that maybe have set up not according to best practices and they're, they're wanting to change that, you know, and that's also overwhelming. And it's like, okay, keep doing what you're doing. You don't have to undo what you're doing, but let's just p- pick a group and let's start with it. And then if that's working, pick a next group and we'll just kind of do it piece by piece. Um, and I think it, I think it helps take some of that pressure off and the, the, the overwhelming feelings that, that people get when they look at the platform. Is that something that like, do you see folks coming at that from like, they're overwhelmed because they're kind of in a position where they see all the things and, you know, so they're, they see everything. And if a light bulb goes off, they're like, Oh my gosh, we should be doing it this way. Right. Now we've got to change everything or we're trying to get, get things off the ground. And, you know, we have this sort of big overarching goal Yeah, is, you know, I can see how someone in that position gets overwhelmed, but is there also an opportunity for someone like they're just at the team level and they're like, Hey, you know, I don't know what the rest of the org is doing, but I think we could be using this better just within our team or our group or um, whoever's supporting the service can they start to sort of make those changes pretty autonomously? Yeah. Depending on how they're set up, they definitely can. And that's, you know, that's one of the best ways that I have seen organizations grow um, their, you know, grow in terms of, you know, new, new page duty teams, new, new, um, you know, business units, maybe start using it is it's more of that kind of grassroots mm-hmm. is that, 
Um, you know, and my team and I talk about this a lot because maybe half, maybe a little bit more than half of us used to be PagerDuty customers. So we've been in the shoes of the people that, you know, that we're working with and we know the pain. Um, you know, when I first started using PagerDuty, I'll be 100% honest. I was like, oh, I don't need this other tool to manage anymore. Um, you know, I, I just I don't need this on my plate. I, you know, everything's fine. And then when I started looking at what PagerDuty did, I was like, okay, everything is not fine. Things could be a lot better. Um, <laughs> and that's really what we started doing, right? We, we, we took advantage of, of it with our own team. And, you know, others started seeing that. Okay, well, I, I want things to be better for me too. Okay, like, well, let's, let's, let's get your team on board here and yeah. we'll, start, we'll start taking a look at your stuff. Um, so it's, it's just a really good way to kind of to grow as well. It, it's it's compelling and it lets the it lets the tool speak for itself right you don't have to kind of take some of the pressure off of us because you've got you've got people on the inside you know promoting pager duty and it it's why we have so many people that used to be customers working here is because we believe in it so much yeah yeah i mean i think it's like there's always those trade-offs right with things that work really well and that very kind of autonomous and grassroots is that you know, you, you end up with a grassroots, right? Like the lawn that's got like different length grass, different colored grass, like it's sort of not very uniform, mm -hmm. um, you know, but Hey, if it's working for, for that part over there um, or that team, then maybe that's, that's fine. Um, but then sure. If there's other teams that they can learn from a peer group, Right. then that can be really effective. So you, it's, there's that trade off of like, if, if it's just totally random and chaotic, how do we help everyone get the most out of something? Mm -hmm. Which kind of brings me to, I don't know if this is on your list, um, but like the, the services standards that was rolled out last yeah. year, right. Which, you know, can give a little bit of like a basic sort of scorecard for, how a service is set up, mm -hmm. which, you know, if you're again in that sort of, Hey, I see the whole lawn, um, uh, sort of view, you can then benchmark and see, okay, all, all these different teams, like these are the ones that are great. These ones are sort of yellow and these ones are kind of red, like stuff's right. really wonky. Um, and then teams can also see their own, right? Like they don't, necessarily see how that stacks up against mm -hmm. everyone else in their company, but they kind of have a sense of like how it must stack up against just basic best right. practices. Right. Yeah, definitely. It's a, that's one of those, I would put that feature on one of those. This seems like a small feature mm. in the grand scheme of things, but yeah, service standards is huge. Um, being able to instantly identify, you know, if, if the path we're going down is going to be a healthy one is, is a, is a big deal. Okay. So, yeah. Totally agree. All right. Um, all right. What's next? All right. Next, I've got, and probably every customer has heard everybody that they've ever worked with at PagerDuty say this, but um, we want PagerDuty to be your central nervous system of your organization. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, PagerDuty should be sitting in the middle of of all of your other tools um, and, and systems. And that's where you're gonna get the most benefit out of it. Because if it's sitting somewhere that's not in the middle, you're not maximizing the benefit of PagerDuty. And we see that a lot. Um, whether it's, you know, you've got all of your monitoring, all of your monitoring tools are going to uh, ServiceNow and then ServiceNow is creating an incident and then it creates a PagerDuty incident and notifies people. You know, you're not, you're never going to get the benefit of, you know, in, in things like alert, you know, correlation and the, the benefits of, uh, of event orchestration and all of those things. So you just, you lose out if you don't put PagerDuty in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really one of the, I think one of the fun things about my job is watching that kind of light bulb go off on, in people's uh, minds when they, when they get it, um, you know, when they've maybe been, you know, experiencing a lot of pain because of, of, of where th the way things are set up. And then when they see when PagerDuty sits in the middle of the benefit they're going to get, it's just, it's, it's real fun to watch. So, yeah. Yeah. What, um, making that change, what does that look like? You know, if a company's kind of already gone on the path yeah. and they, they sort of 
had that idea of like, oh, pager duties, once we get to the point where we, we need to like get the right person involved, yeah. that's when we use pager duty. And they they sort of weren't aware of perhaps uh, what happens like if you just put pager duty in the middle and let it sort of mm-hmm. see things as it's happening. Right. How do people make that change? I think it goes back to the not boiling the ocean. Like you don't have to make this big cut over, uh, you know, pick a, pick a group, pick a, pick a team. That's, you know, I, I tend to like to pick things that are not too easy, but somewhat easy, but also where you're going to resolve a lot of you know pain too. Right. That, that low hanging fruit is there, mm-hmm. um, you know, so pick, pick something and, and start with that. So maybe it's not a team, maybe it's a monitoring tool. Right. So, you know, we, we, maybe if you use, you know, Datadog and, uh, you know, SCOM or something like that. We're going to start with Datadog. We're going to take Datadog out of going straight to ServiceNow and we're going to have it, you know, have uh, PagerDuty and just that. So you can just do it piece by piece. There's no, there's no pressure there. Um, yeah. I mean, and it seems like some of the ways that that might, you might measure, like, how are we doing? Are we making progress? Like, what are you... I would imagine things like, well, if everything is getting kind of dumped into, um, say, ServiceNow, it's, it, it's creating a lot of excess yeah. tickets. Yeah, right? there's a lot of noise. Yeah, there's um, a lot of noise and, yeah. there. And then it's whatever whatever you're doing to help you process those, right? Like someone's go, having to go through manually, like that can mm-hmm. get really expensive. Yep. But, um, you know, on the surface, the simple way is to be like, well, there should be less tickets, right? If we're doing this right, right there should be fewer of these. Right. Um, is, is there anything else that's like the indicator of like, yes, you're on the right path here. Um, by putting page duty in the middle, you should be seeing these things happening. Yeah, I think I think the big one you've mentioned, right, is that you, you'll probably start seeing less incidents because you're going to get less duplication. Um yeah, and I think there's different levels of that too, right? You have the the pain of, oh, I've got all this, I've got to sift through it. And then it's like the worst stage of I'm so tired of looking at this, I'm just going to start ignoring everything. Mm. Um, which is which is which we see a lot. Um, and we we don't want that either, right? We want to make sure the right things are being seen and the other things are are not being seen. But if you want to go look them up or audit them, they're there. And that's that's the benefit too, is is you know, we're frequently telling our customers, you know, just if even if you're not sure what to do with it yet, have pager duty ingest it because you can decide later. You can create a, an event rule. You can uh, have an event orchestration. You can you can decide later, but just set up the integration. Have everything start coming in, and then and then decide what you want to do with it. And and we've got a lot of great tools, right? To that you can be able to see, even if you don't want to turn certain things on, um, you know, with like event event orchestration and some of that correlation and grouping and things like that, that, you know, you can, you can see what the the benefits are without even having to actually turn stuff on yet. It'll go look at what's, what's been coming in. So. Okay. Um, all right. We're, we're at like six. Yeah. So have you got some more? I do. Okay. Um, I think, I think this next one kind of feeds right into what we were just talking about too. And um, it's an important one. It's mm. events, alerts, incidents, and understanding what the difference between each of these things is. Because I think if you're going to start using the PagerDuty platform, uh, it's important to know. And especially because other other tools might define it differently, it's good to know, you know how we define it um, and how that makes sense. So if you don't know, an event is basically just anything that comes into PagerDuty. That could be a change event. It could be a monitoring uh, tool. It could be an email. It could be anything that comes in. Um, and then you have alerts, uh, which, you know, then you're separating out the change events that, that go and can be its own thing. Um, but alerts are not necessarily things that need to be actioned. They're just things that you need to be aware of or want to, you know, have historical record of. Um, and then we would define incidents as something that action needs to be taken on, right? So an alert. So you're always going to have an event. An event could be an alert, and an alert could be an incident. 
mm. essentially. So, and and that's that's overly simplistic, obviously for for this conversation. But um, I th I think once you understand that, that it makes a whole lot more sense the way PageDuty is built and the way that we do things. Um, so that's something that we try to try to tell people kind of early on of making sure they're they're aware of what those things are. Yeah, uh, defining your terms is really key. Uh, yeah. So I'm picturing like concentric circles with, you know, the biggest circle being events, right? This yep. is the this is the biggest thing. Everything fundamentally, there's an event somewhere. Yep. A smaller sort of circle making a, sort of the donut shape inside of that, right, is the alerts. Some of these events are alerts, or or can multiple events be an alert? Uh, no, okay. multiple alerts can be an uh, incident, but yeah, an event's okay. going to so be a pure subset, right? Mathematically yep. speaking. Yep. And then a subset of those alerts, once again, is like the incident. So now this is the smallest circle in the center, yep. right? Of the concentric. The gooey circle. filling. Okay. Yes. The filling. Yes. Yep. Delicious. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm a little bit of a visual thinker, so sometimes just that makes sense, um, and 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 I, I can see how that's useful for people to understand because it's right. people throw around words like alerts a lot, right, um, or right. incident, and yeah, and I and I get to that it can be confusing, right? Because if I'm being woken up in the middle of the night by an incident, I'm being alerted. So like even some of the terminology can be confusing. Um, but, but the, the difference is important because, you know, back to what we were talking about with setting up PagerDuty to be in the middle, um, where we see if, if people are, are having their monitoring tools directly inter integrated with something like ServiceNow, not to pick on ServiceNow, but, you know, typically when we see customers doing that, a lot of those incidents should just be alerts and not incidents. Mm. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's the real difference. So we want to take those alerts and determine which ones should actually be incidents and, you know, group them together if there's, you know, multiple, multiple things coming in at the same time or you know, with the same context, you know, whatever, whichever it is. Okay. All right. Um, what is, what's next? All right. I keep, I keep almost saying how many I have left, but you don't want me to tell you, so. I think we're at seven, right? Or at six. Yeah, we have we have seven. So this will be the eighth. Okay, eighth, yes. Um all right, this one is our support docs, I would argue, exceed industry standard quality. So if you are ever ever um confused or unsure of something, our support docs are amazing. Um and I say that because you know my team we're we're more on the technical side, but obviously we don't know everything and we, we use them on a regular basis. And I'm always like, wow, that's exactly what I needed. And that's exactly where it was. And sometimes I'm like, oh, but I, I get mad because I'm like, oh, the, the, the document doesn't have this. And then I get to the bottom where it's like frequently asked questions and it's like, oh yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I would just remind people that we have really good documentation. The people at PagerDuty that do that um, do a really good job of it. Okay. So yeah, go confidently go forth and check the docs. That's right. That's you know, right. There. Yeah. Um, any any kind of tips or tricks on navigating the docs or um, you know following them? Like if there's like, hey, this one's been really useful multiple times. Um, yeah. Any any. Yeah. I mean. I guess I guess you have to kind of differentiate what our what I mean by docs, right? Because we have our knowledge base, we have our you know community, um, and it's all it's all good. Because a lot of times, you know, the things that are posted that are kind of nested deep inside of our you know community forum is just solid gold. But sometimes it's you know harder to find if you're trying to look for something. Um, I, this sounds kind of silly. I I usually just Google stuff. <laughs> um, I. I I don't, I don't typically use like the search in our, in our uh, document portal or anything like that. I usually just Google things and that it allows me to, to, to look at things beyond just the one little area I'm looking for, but it, all the PagerDuty stuff tends to be up at the top. So um, yeah, Google's your friend. 
Yeah. Google works just fine. Yeah. Um, okay. That's good to know. Yep. Um, all right. What about, let's see, we're on number nine. Number nine. Yep. All right. Um, I've got, go get an education at Pager Duty University. Okay. Right. Because I think this is another one of those things where if you've got uh, customers that have been around for a while, they might not know certain things or it might have been a while or maybe teams are, maybe the organization's not new to PagerDuty, but maybe a new team's being onboarded and they just need to get up to speed. There is so much um, good resources on on PDU and a lot of it is free. You know, so take advantage of, of the free stuff. Plus we're always doing webinars. We're always doing, you know, things like this. Um, so just, Trying to, I, I try to remind customers that there's again a lot of good information out there um, that they can go and, and check out. So, um, you pointed out that there's a lot that's free, which is great. That was one of the questions that I had about it. Uh, and I know that there's some certifications, and it, I, I feel like at my time in at PageDuty, I've already seen like a number of new certifications get yeah. developed. Uh, which is great because it's partly just keeping up with the product. Um, yep. Those are yep. also it's great to have kind of like that's a standard. You've met it. Um, you can yep. share that out. Uh, put it on your resume. Um, and they're not they're not easy either. Like my team, we live and breathe agility all the time, and um, I I will be the first to admit that I've failed a couple of times the first time I've taken some of these. So. Don't give up. You can you can uh, have a couple multiple attempts. So uh, don't don't let that scare you off. It's it's intentionally meant to be to be difficult because it really it really tests your knowledge and you learn a lot going through the process. Yeah. And is there something like like thinking about what kind of role someone's in for these different uh, Patriot University courses or certifications? Um, if someone's you know yeah. the admin for the account, there might be. Right certain things that are like, yes, it really makes sense. But someone else is like, Hey, I'm just a user. I'm just someone who's, I'm just going on call mm -hmm. and I need to understand what I'm looking at. Or what about kind of some of those things where you're like, Hey, I, I really want to optimize. Um, you know, maybe I'm not the, the admin, but I'm looking at how our team is functioning and right. we're, we're drowning in work and we're trying to figure out ways to claw back more hours in the week and, maybe there's a way that page duty can help with that, but right. I've got to dig in and learn how to set up, you know, event orchestration and, and get smarter about some things. So, yeah, there's definitely, I mean, I think definitely those certifications help with that. Um, you know, because they are, they are kind of persona based, you know, mm -hmm. based upon what the, what the need is. Um, and you'll go through a lot. So, so maybe if you're an incident responder, right. And you're used to, you're used to being on that role, but you might not know what, what the best practices are for somebody in that role. This is going to be a, a great way for you to, to know what that is. Um, and just a quick plug. Um, you know, I just found out today that I know that our, our incident response certification, um, I think is free on Wednesday. So one of the things that you typically would have to pay for, um, you know, so be on the lookout for that. Okay. Um, yeah, I will look out for maybe a link because I, I have seen those kind of promotions pop up where yep. certain certifications um, will, will have like limited time. Get That's right. School. Yep. It's cool. Um, all right. So that's that's nine. All right. Are so I actually do have 10. Oh, my gosh. OK, here we go. So the, the last this last one is kind of. Um, this could be a bigger topic, but it's. Process automation is not just for incident management. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we want you to take advantage of process automation. You know our our tools, formerly known as Rundeck, uh, to sit in the middle of your your incident response and incident management process. But uh, you can think bigger than that too. Um, you know, when I first the first time I ever used Rundeck um, was like about a decade ago. Um, I think I'm dating myself here, but it was about a decade ago and we were using it to, you know, deploy applications as an application deployment tool. Um, we see a lot of people managing things like Ansible with it. There's lots of, there's lots of use cases for process automation beyond the, the incident response piece. Um, 
But even if you're using it for incident response, um, I think sometimes it's hard to know where to start and how big to think or how small to think when it comes to automating some of those processes. Mm -hmm. um, because it could be something like, oh, I need to, I want to go get some diagnostics from this, this server, or I might want to go run these, these scripts, these tests or something on, on, on that. So you, you might think, oh, I, I just need to write, write some automation that goes and does that. But then you, you know, take a step back and you're like, well, I don't, typically when I go and run these tests, maybe I need to go and request access first because I don't have access to these things. You know, so that's an opportunity. Okay, well, maybe we automate the access provisioning process to where you don't have to go and request access in the middle of an incident where it's, you know, just adding on time to that process. So I, I would encourage people if, if you are using process automation or thinking about doing that, you know, just have a have a talk with your customer success manager or have them engage with us. We're, we're happy to have these conversations just to to really explore what those benefits are, are going to be um, and what those use cases are. Cause sometimes it's really hard to, to come up with those use cases. Um, yeah. I think it's um, it's so open-ended compared to right. something like, you know, incident management where you're right. thinking about, yes, that is a very clear, painful use case right. that everyone would love to be better. Um, uh, one of the things that, I see kind of come up a lot is also when you sort of think begin as you mean to go on, right? Which is at the end, you want to be able to go back and measure that, hey, we've automated something and we're getting some kind of benefit from it. Right. So when you think about, okay, well, where is that benefit going to come from? Um, whether it's like, hey, we've, we've, um, we've saved a lot of time, right? Like we've gotten back, you know, X number of hours, right? We've, we've been able to sort of um, almost that that junior teammate that we've we've asked for years to be able to add capacity to the team and it keeps getting denied um, or something like that where it's like but we need that capacity mm -hmm. um, there's there's a dollar cost right, right. With that and sometimes like then when you work backwards um, through the math of like well how would you calculate that this is a uh, you know a, a junior team member the equivalent of being able to just hire a junior team member. Mm -hmm. What would that be? Well, you've got, you know, the number of hours and the time it takes and then the number of times it's run. And then you start to realize like, you've got to be looking at certain things that are, these are not activities that you're doing once a quarter. Right. It, they're activities that you are either already doing or you would like to be able to do as as often as you need to, mm -hmm. um, whether that's every week or every day or multiple times a day. Right. Those are the kinds of things that are going to have the biggest payoff and they may not be that big and sexy, right? Mm -hmm. like, like be like pretty mundane, but it's exactly the kind of thing that's just right. like leeching away. And those little things add up time and it adds up. And so, yep. but you know, you don't want that sort of like, Hey, it's, an, it's an exotic corner case but it would be great if, but it was like, that's probably the kind of thing that it's not going to come up that often. Right. What are those things that you're just doing every week? Um, yep. and, and that's a good place to start, right? Is like, just, you know, I, I've kind of trained myself to do it living in this world, but it's, you know, in my own job function, I'll, I'll be like, I'm, what are the things that a, you hate to do and the things that B you do more than once start writing those things down. Because those are great use cases for automation, um, you know. So, yeah, you really just have to kind of change the way that you, you think about things. Um, and I, I think definitely certain people are more bent to think about it. But I think anybody can can really pick that up and start thinking, oh, wow, like let's there's so many ways we can improve and, and be more efficient. Um, yeah. To the use of these, these tools. Um, well, and I think like I'm, you, you, I, I'm picturing the Venn diagram of what you've just described, mm -hmm. right? Like one circle is like things you hate to do and then right. things that you have to do more than once. And whatever that overlap sort of right. wedge in the middle is like automate this. Right. And, Hopefully it's not just one circle. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but that's the, um, you know, the kind of the, the classic description, right? You talk to folks who are, 
um, developers and software engineers. And mm -hmm. you hear a lot where they're like, if I have to do something more than once, you're like, I'm going to start to write a script for it. Yep. And that's, so it sounds like that kind of just twitch that a lot of folks have just like, oh my gosh, if I have to do this more than once, I want a script to do it for me. That's right. fine. But then there's that question of who gets to invoke that script, mm -hmm. right? If it, if it kind of comes back to you and you're like, yeah, sure. I've done this before. And at least I've got a script to help me, but you still got interrupted to right. do it. Right. That's kind of where it seems to me like, you know, the, the run deck and, and page duty process automation is particularly good at not just like, sure, there's lots of different ways you could write a script for yourself. Right. The question is, can you let some other team or user invoke it when they need it so that they right. don't have to come interrupt you? Exactly. So it's like the third circle, I don't know, yeah. in the diagram. Like you, you hate to do it. You have to do it more than once. And part of the reason you have to do it more than once is probably because some other team. People keep uh, bugging you about it. It's bugging you about it, right? Yep. It's like, right. and you know, sometimes that's because they're in the heat of an incident, but sometimes right. it's because they're trying to get their jobs done. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess where you want to be someday, right, is maybe I'm not a user in PagerDuty anymore because I've automated myself out of that. And nobody needs to to get me on a call anymore. Mm. They they can just they know they know the things that need to be run or the things just run automatically. Yeah. So. Um. Yeah, you're not I, I, like you're always getting called in as one of the the cast yeah. of characters like involved, but mm -hmm. not you really shouldn't be there right. at all. Right. Um, yeah. That's an interesting way to think about it too. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So that's the 10, 10 that's is a great 10. number um, yeah. for, for, it's a real nice round number. Um, right. I, you know, I think the only things that I, I guess maybe come to mind are maybe some things around like, you know, what you can do with event orchestration and like enriching like, Oh yeah. But maybe that's sort of like a 201 or 301 level type of. Right. Right. Um, things. That yeah. I mean, you, you could, I mean, I stopped at 10, but I mean, there's an infinite amount of, right. of things to topics to go through for sure. Yeah. This seems like a pretty good starting list for folks uh, yeah. to dig into and, and get, you know, start to like, up their game um, pretty quickly. Definitely. So thank you, Matt. This has been great. Yeah, thanks for having me. You know, I was thinking actually a little bit about how this type of thing of like, oh, write me a list for this. Like this is the this is the kind of thing people, you know, they're putting into like chat GPT is like, mm -hmm. just give me this. But, right. you know, and it'll give you an answer. And it it's not like, oh, full-blown hallucinations, it's wrong. But mm -hmm. it lacks like, the wisdom, right? right? That someone in your position who actually sits and works with customers day in and day out right? Um, and has that sort of vantage point that like, uh, yeah, ChatGPT would not be able to provide like yeah. that list of answers mm -hmm. with the depth of like, no, this is, this is why I have this list. Right. So I'm thank grateful for that. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. Um, right. And I am, I am grateful for you taking the time to join us today. Yeah, just thank a you. Reminder. Oh, go ahead. No, I just thank, thank you for having me. I, I enjoyed being here. Yeah. Um, uh, I will, I'm going to write down this list uh, and probably post it over on the community uh, along with the replay as some, some show notes for this one. Um, just reminder, tune in next week. We'll have Nicole, but got, on PagerDuty's APIs. And uh, I did hear Matt mention when he talked about the gift box that we are running a survey uh, about uh, PagerDuty's APIs. You can find it as one of the challenges in uh, the PagerDuty community. If you go to community.pagerduty.com um, and log in there, that's where all of our forums are. But you can see it up uh, as one of the challenges. You can take a quick survey. Um, much appreciated. We'll have maybe some of the results from that um, and and digging into kind of why we're running that with uh, when we talked to Nicole. Then we'll be back with Sam Newman on resiliency. And then a little bit later, we will be talking about PagerDuty's plugin for Backstage. 
Thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you, Matt, for joining us and dropping 10 things every PagerDuty user needs to know. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.